Yes, I'm green, I'm purple, hi nomads, hi party people everywhere. You not you know why we're here from the title screen. Let's just let's just get this show over with while I still have a shred of semblance of calmness. Okay. Last time we left off it was the other two episodes, which names I've already forgotten. It's that memorable a show. But we're at episode three, which is Trespass. Where it opens up to a recap of the last two episodes and the events that transpired throughout that. And then we have the actual episode opening up with the Danvers clan looking over the body from the last episode of a little boy, which is from a family called the Richardsons. Stupid last name, sure, but whatever. And Elena is just trying to protest moving the body because they're trying to discern who would kill a young, innocent, I'm guessing 10-year-old or 9-year-old boy. Because... It's kind of wrong to move a dead body from an active scene, but Clay, the one that wants to move the body, was saying that it's a move target to make them look like the bad guys, which is kind of true and smart. Kind of wish they had more smart dialogue like this in the last two episodes. I digress, though. So... As soon as they're doing that, the hunts, the hunters that were coming onto the property in the last episode, which is illegal when you have private property because then you're in, you're in the wrong and will be executed in the judicial judicial sense of being locked up and put away. As soon as they sense that they're coming, Jeremy's just like, "Don't move the body. If we do, it'll make a look, it'll make us look even more guilty than what we do now." So they don't move the body, they are just standing there when the hunters show up. Big fucking shock, because we all knew they were coming in the, in the last episode. And as soon as they just find the body, they just start accusing the Danvers clan while, tra uh, while trespassing on their own privately owned property that they have the right to keep private and, uh, and have no one else on the land that they don't want on there. Meaning whatever accusations that they have, the trespassing itself would deem them put away for a fine or put into jail for a small amount of time. Whether they did the crime or not, you have to have a warrant to go onto private property, which the hunters did not. So their accusations mean as much as this chain on my Blue Yeti microphone. So... They start having a big conflict conflict going on where they're starting to threaten the Danvers for them not doing anything for the wolf's hunt, even though they're technically in the wrong of a legal standpoint of not moving from the fucking line. Seriously, writers, why are you doing this? Are you trying to show that you don't give a semblance of care for your own plot? So they then start taking the safety off their gun while Elena is staring down one of the dogs named Blue which gives me weird Wolf's Rain flashbacks for some reason, and I wish I knew why. But anyway, Elena starts giving the dog a sort of hungry, sort of attack look. It makes the dog very uncomfortable. One of the hunters takes the safety off. Oh, so we're going to do attempted murder and trespassing on private property, which would do so well against the sheriff's department if they were to do natural law in this show. Oh, the semblance of care is so little. So as soon as the safety is taken off, Clay takes the butt of the gun in one of the hunter's hands, which we find out was Braxton, the guy from before, where he hits him with the butt of the gun to his nose, and then the dog just runs off after looking at Elena for too long in a state of fright and panic. So after all that is said and done, when Braxton just calling out for his dog, Clay is just threatening the hunters if they were to use their guns again on the property, he would use the guns on them in turn while Jeremy's trying to de-escalate the situation by saying they're going to call the cops to try and get the entire thing settled amicably and in an intellectual manner which they should have done after finding the body just saying can we call this into the authorities and we apologize for stepping on your land they did not do this which kind of makes me go into a thing that I'm going to talk to you guys about in a bit so Jeremy has Nick and his dad Antonio escort the hunters off the land, but Braxton is still visibly upset saying that he's still going to get to the bottom of this because he thinks they're the ones involved. And again, Braxton, you have no point in the matter because you're trespassing on private property, 
which yet again would get you in legal problems as well. So Jeremy makes a call to the sheriff's department and then that's when the credits begin. And you want to know something guys? Because the show doesn't have a semblance of care for the notes I've made for the rest of this whole review in not only this episode but for the entirety of the next episode you guys are going to see in a few minutes from now. I will give zero care to explaining as much of the plot to you guys because the show barely cares about its own direction at this point in its own epilogue, epilogue state of episode 3 from the standpoint of episodes 1 and 2. So, here comes Lackluster Review Episode 1. After the opening sequence, Elena and Clay fight. Then, fam the family studies the situation, after which, the sheriffs arrive on the scene to find out stuff. Then, Jeremy sends Elena and Clay out to find the mud. Why? Because, well, romantic tension needs to be built up for these two characters that we don't give a shit about because the show didn't bother to do so at the beginning. <laughs> and Nick and Logan are sent to find a mutt called Carl Marston. And Pete is sent along with them by Jeremy's rule. Jeremy and Elena discuss Philip and have a commentary on the wolf shifter's life and how it's filled with lies to cover up their own existence from humanity. Elena has Jeremy get rid of the flowers because spare Clay's feelings, I guess. Philip and Elena have another phone conversation which Clay overhears when he plays some shitty ass country music when she comes out of the house to get in the jeep so that they can track down the person. Jeremy and the sheriff, who we la later find out is last named Morgan in this episode, discuss the current problem. And then An Antonio comes up and they give the sheriff as much information as they can. And then Antonio and Jeremy feel the urgency about trying to find the mutt as soon as possible. Philip and his bosses have a discussion about a vodka campaign on the bays of Toronto. I'm sorry, by the bays of Toronto for a sale. You see how little care there is in these notes, just like how little care there is in the story. Elna and Clay have a spat over relationships and how their relationship would have been so perfect because Elena wouldn't lie to him. But do you even care? The hunters give Elena and Clay a warning on behalf of Bear Valley over them not doing anything over a wolf that just happened to be on their property when the citizens don't know shit about shit and want to blame them for whatever. Elena and Clay set out to find the mutt at a rave. Ironically, said mutt goes to the rave for, I'm guessing, either rape time or kill time. Or both. Investigation of boy's death continues as sheriff department brings in even forensic science. Philip ha has a family moment with his judgmental mom who's saying s some bullshit about Elena that is honestly true. Skip. Nick, Logan, and Pete seek to lure Marston to Nick's new club. And we're introduced to a new minor character named Amanda. Marston arrives at Nick's club. Yay. Elena sets out to the rave alone, but Clay tries to stop her because he says they work better as a team. Compromise plan erupts though. She'll lure him outside and he'll snatch him up. The old bait and snatch. Elena rebukes, rebukes ever wanting to do stuff shifter again, but has to go in the fray anyway and just says fuck it. Riveting, yay. Tiny Elena and Clay romantic tension moment because romantic tension moment is what we need. I honestly do not care. Marston sits down with Nick and his group about giving information on other mutts. And then we go back to the rave scene and the rave scene is trying too hard to be a rave. Elena hunts for the mutt and finds him lurking in the shadows, just staring at people with a weird sort of stare, like... Uh, 
Elena and the Mutt have a discussion on his actions and what's wrong. As the Mutt has a nihilistic sense of himself saying that he is death. And he enjoys giving people death. Okay. The Mutt tries to threaten Elena, but it backfires. And during said threat, the Mutt begins to sporadically change into a wolf shifter sort of creature thing or whatever. I've honestly stopped caring at this point in the review, so... Whatever. Clay waits at the wrong door while Elena keeps the guy away from the humans inside of an office. Then we go back to Nick and Marston discussing the current info, info crisis and wants information from him, Mutt to main pack. But Marston has a price for the info, territory of his own. Anywho, the Mud escapes from the holding cell that he was in by Elena's choice. And so Elena frantic frantically searches for him. Yay. The Mud then attacks and people go into panic around all sorts of locations in the rave. Exciting. And from this whole motion of things, the sheriff's department hears about what's going on at the rave party and goes into action by going into all their cars, with Jeremy and Antonio getting the news shortly after. And after one near kill and one de definite kill, the mud is then outside where the sheriff's department opens fire on him first and then right when he's about to kill the main sheriff character that we're supposed to care about a car conveniently runs him over so this plot thread is over i don't know but elena goes back inside for the person that was bitten and finds out he's going to start turning clay examines him for what he is a drug user and a panicking teenager gives him a mercy kill Elena looks on horrified they leave the club and then after that we go back to Nick Logan and Pete who go over Marston's deal and try to discern what to do Jeremy then calls Pete and Logan to tell them the mud is dead and that they're free to leave and Logan and Pete prepare to leave for their own separate lives. Pete going back on tour and Logan going back to his girlfriend. And not before Pete gives them one last hug before fading out to Ellen and Clay discussing tonight's events. Where all Ellen does is lament about her abilities of control, being a ticking time bomb, and Clay's mercy killing and overly saying that she's no longer needed. Again. While Clay is just saying, keep telling yourself that. That's why I keep saying to myself about, this show is going to get better, right? And then my brain is like, keep telling yourself that. Keep telling yourself that. Jeremy then walks in later, later on to tell uh, Elena that everyone does need her. But she says that she's leaving and never coming back. So we're going to set the timer for the imploding on her own words now. Elena returns to Toronto and Pete embraces her. And during said embrace, they have four, um, foreplay talk, which leads to morning sex on the dining room table. Classy work, Bitten. I know you're trying to compete with Lost Girl for sex scenes, but here's the problem. Lost Girl had sex scenes that actually mattered to the character because that was what the character needed to heal. And when that wasn't the case, it was for a relationship where it was supposed to lead to them having sexual and sexual sort of escapades. But I digress. Uh, after, after that, they have an after sex talk about Pete supposedly getting high fives and then going to have sex in the bed before they start making dinner where Logan and Rachel are invited to dinner by Philip. 
And then we're going back to Stonehaven with Jeremy and Antonio discussing a project for the mutts in the future, while everyone that's still there are lamenting that Elena didn't stay. So sad. Boo-hoo. Philip and Rachel ask Logan and Elena innocently enough about the family and about their whole lie process. They do so clumsily by saying it was a cousin named Di Danielle who had a son and a daughter, four and six. I don't know if the girl was six, the boy was four. I, I don't know or care at this point. We all know this. Then... Antonio and Nick set out to track down Marston because he seemed to know a lot more than what he was letting on to, which sounds interesting, but the show made interesting a real rarity at this point, so why even bother? Elena and Rachel have a discussion over relationships and Logan and Elena's family while on the terrace. And in turn, Logan and Philip have to talk about Elena's well-being, while Logan just says about the positive effects that he has on Elena. When they're sitting down to have a drink, we're just treated to Antonio and Nick about to drive off, when all of a sudden there's a phone call from Clay to Logan, calling up, look, and calling up to say about a new situation that made Logan seem depressed. And we're supposed to be like, why is he sounding so depressed? Big shock for whoever thought that the plot was over after three episodes. A main character died that makes all of the care that you have for this show die along with it. One of the only cool and interesting characters dies this episode by the name of Pete. The lovable historian caring, compassionate individual named Pete. The very person that made watching the show enjoyable along with Antonio and Jeremy died. And now the Danvers clan are holding grief over Pete's death as the cam camera then just cuts out while the credits roll. As you can tell by my own blatant expression, episode 3 is where my interest for the show died originally and it has not changed today. How they were trying to do the whole escalation for what would happen next happened so boringly and stupidly that I'm honestly surprised that they, just, that they even bothered. Because here's the thing guys, if you're going to compete with other supernatural shows, do something that's interesting. Having a main character that not only bitches and moans, but never does what's genuinely right in a situation unless they have no other option is not a way to make us like the character. It just makes us really want to punch the main character in the face. Second, forced romantic tension is not what a good love triangle makes. You want to make us feel like there's a genuine love triangle? Have it where it actually feels like it's well-deserved and earned. You don't see me complaining about how the love triangle in the secret circle was undeserved because that was genuinely built on from episode after episode, going into the relationships and even elaborating on where they stand now, even though there's a problem going on between the people. It was truly expanded on. You don't see me talking about how bad the love triangle is in Lost Girl because Lost Girl's love triangle actually has a good conclusion for itself where both parties end up with who they want in the long run. When one person passes away and the other one is basically having longevity and living a lot longer, the possibility of being with both pairs is more prevalent when the series concludes. You don't see me bullshitting about the love triangle in the Tomorrow People because, unlike Bitten, the love triangle in the Tomorrow People, and I can't believe I'm saying this, was well-deserved, well-crafted, and smart about how its execution was. 
mostly because the main love triangle could resolve itself faster. Honestly, I'm only going to give this show one more review before I am calling it done with Bitten. Because the next episode after this is when they finally have a direction for the show, but it's finally just too late. It's it's honestly just too late to care at this point. 